Hello and welcome to this video lecture on CCNA2 route, Routing and Switching Essentials, Chapter 1, with me, Joachim Schäverstad from the University of uh, Skövde. And this lecture will kick off this uh, video lecture series on CCNA2 version 6, uh, Routing and Switching Essentials, which is essentially a course where we're going to go through uh, routing and switching operations uh, pretty much at a glance. So what we'll, what we'll do is introduction to uh, routing, introduction and a little bit more advanced switching and then we're doing, gonna do some MISC at the ending lecture. So we're going to do access control lists which is essentially firewalls, uh, DHCP for allocation of IP addressing, network address translation. Uh, you're going to have to see what that is about. I'm going to do some management and, and maintenance. So this is the second course in the CCNA uh, version 6 package and what we're going to explore here or what we're going to do is that we're going to build on CCNA 1 where we learned about the OSI model, we learned about IP addressing and we learned the, a very brief introduction to, uh, to networking. Now we're going to build on that and look at how we can do more advanced stuff with, with routers and switches and some other networking. Uh, some other networking stuff so that we can start building our own networks. And then uh, I would really encourage you to do CCNA3. There is a lecture series for that as, that as well. And in CCNA3, we're going to build a discourse and do more advanced routing and more advanced switching uh, so that we can really build uh, larger networks. So, um, well, before we kick, out, kick off this course or this lecture, I want to talk to you a little bit about the learning method or the teaching method that we're trying to employ in this course. Uh, it's called context-based microtraining, and it's essentially a learn-by-doing approach. So the idea is that we have those video lectures. Video lectures allows you to uh, to watch the lectures whenever you want. You can pause uh, and speed up and speed down and rewatch and do whatever you want. Uh, so the idea is that you should work with those video lectures that will include demos. You should also make sure that you pause and do the practicals. So uh, the idea is that we do a little bit of theory, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, we try to keep the theory to a minimum or at least the lecture part. And then we try to do demos and have you do practicals. And that's the way that you're going to learn by actually implementing what we talk about. Uh, you should also be aware that you do have to read through the CCNA material. So either you're doing this as... Uh, as a part of a course that you're taking with me or some other teacher around the globe and in that case you do need to, uh, to read the material otherwise passing the theoretical quiz is going to be extremely hard uh, also the idea with this way of teaching isn't that you should be alone in in your bedroom or in your chamber chamber and looking at the, these videos to fully prepare you should have teachers and you should use the teachers so whenever there is something that makes your heart go hmm what the hell is this then pause and ask your teachers and make sure that we can have a lively discussion and uh, as I said, whenever I talk too much or too, too fast, or it's just too much for you, pause. You can pause and look in the material, you can pause and do a practical. And actually within the CCNA material, there are, uh, in each and every one of the chapters, there are those uh, great uh, sort of test yourself exercises where you can do small quizzes or small exercises to, um, to make sure that you grasp the material. Um, and I would really encourage you to really work with the first chapters from the beginning because uh, data communication and networking is about knowing the fundamentals and building on that. So when you really understand the fundamentals, moving on to the more advanced stuff is quite easy. So that's the learning method. Um, if you really employ it and do what I said, that's up to you, but I really encourage you to to have you get the most out of this. And having the most out of this is having a smooth sailing through the practical and theoretical quiz. So, uh, for this lecture, we're going to start with chapter one, and chapter one is about routing concepts. So what we're going to do is look at the router and the router's role in the network at a glance, and then we're going to dive in a little bit deeper in the upcoming lectures. So what we're going to do is do an initial router configuration, which is pretty much re uh, rep 
repetition from CCNA1, and then we're going to look at how routers make decisions and how the routers operate within a network. Uh, and this is a good time for me to tell you that I do assume that you know about the CCNA1 material. So if you're not really comfortable with IP addressing and subnetting and, and that, it's a good time for you to go and pause this video and review CCNA1 before you come back. Because you're going to have a hard time following this if you're not uh, fairly comfortable with IP addressing and the very basics of networking. So. Uh, let's start the lecture and let's begin with looking at a little uh, map or, or if you want with network characteristics. So whenever we talk about networks, a network is basically a collection of interconnected devices. That's what make out a, a network. And there are some characteristics that we want a network to, to hold or that a network will hold to a certain degree. So let's start talking about the, the top uh, uh, the top circle, which is the topology. And a topology is basically the outlines of the network. You can have either a physical topology that would describe how how devices are actually connected, uh, how devices are actually placed, where cables are actually going. Uh, that would be a physical topology. And you can also have a logical topology, which is what we're most used to see within this course, which is an outline of how devices are interconnected uh, in a more abstract level. Then we have speed as a characteristic. There's going to be speed. We usually talk about it in terms of troop, uh, throughput or bandwidth. And there's going to be a cost, which is, uh, in this sense, the cost of building and maintaining the network. And there's going to be security characteristics. We're going to talk about availability, which is to some, um, including me, a security, security feature. And availability is how available the network are to users in terms of uptime, in terms of reachability. Can you reach the network from at home? And so on and so forth. And then we have scalability that is ever important. Scalability is the property or the ability of the network to grow. So uh, what happens if we have a network of 10 users and then we're going to scale that up to 100 user users? Is that something that we can easily do when then the network is scalable? Uh, is it something that is very hard to do? Well, then we have a lower degree of scalability. And finally, we have reliability. Um, how, how reliable is the network? Can we be certain that packages are reaching the destinations? Are devices up and running like all the time? Are there redundant paths, meaning that there are more than one link between one source and one destination, and so on and so forth. And those are all characteristics that we're going to explore uh, deeper. Uh, I would say that this map or this picture here is basically outlining what we're going to do throughout CCNA2 and CCNA3. We're going to look at how we can uh, achieve all of those characteristics or work towards those characteristics. Uh, so the topic of today was, as I said, looking at the role of the router. So I'm going to start discussing the uh, the role of the router with, uh, with another picture. And as you see here in the middle, we have what is called a wide area network, a double uh, Double VAN, which is uh, a wide area network. The most common one is the internet. A wide area network is essentially a network that is used to connect other networks. We're going to discuss that in more detail in CCNA4, which I plan to do a lecture series for, but that's something that's going to be released in a couple of months, I guess. So we have the wide area network and then we have a lot of local area networks. So what you have at your home, that's one local area network. What you have at your campus, that, that is one local area network. What you have, uh, well, basically any network with, uh, you can say any network with end devices is most likely a local area network. And you can do the definition of local area network uh, a little bit differently depending on, uh, depending on, on when you're saying it. Because in some definitions, the local area network would be um, would be a segmentation of a router. So in that, well, in this case, this is the local area network. This is one, and this is one. But in some cases, you could refer to, let's say, that this switch right here was indeed a router. Then you can say it could refer to this as a local area network, this as a local area network, this as a local area network, and so on and so forth. Every part of the network that is segmented by a router. I would prefer to 
uh, say that a local area network is more of an administrative boundary, uh, the network that we're responsible for at an end site, and then call the different segmentations that are made up from, f from the router for broadcast domains. But let's not get into this. For now, a local area network is a administrative boundary of network devices that are, that's under our control. So, uh, so the role of the router would be to interconnect those local area networks. So here there is a router that's responsible for connecting this branch network to the cloud, and this router is responsible for knowing how to send traffic from this network through the router up until the cloud and to any other network. So the role of the router is sort of being a post office that knows about addresses to other networks and knows how to forward uh, packets to those other networks, just as a po post office would do uh, in the real world. So looking uh, uh, at the role of the router in a little bit more text-based and a little bit more formal way, uh, the primary role or roles of the router is to interconnect network and make forwarding decisions. So in interconnecting networks, routers do connect networks and can connect uh, networks of different media types. So you see in the picture here that this is a Ethernet link and an Ethernet network that is connecting to some sort of serial network and that works fine, a router can do that. Uh, and it does forward data based on IP addresses. So that's layer three addressing. Uh, from the network layer in the OSI model, as you should remember from CCNA1. Uh, the router also makes forwarding decision, and in, in doing that, it determines where a package should be sent based on the destination IP address. So it examines the destination IP address of a data package, and then it sends out that package in the best way possible. Um, and that is also the role of the router then to determine the best path. And you, can, could, could, you could make the analogy to the post office. So if there is a package originating from Sweden that is going to go to, uh, to the US, you would most likely send it by a plane right over to the US. You wouldn't go sending it by boat to Russia and then take it by train to China and then take it by car to Europe again and then take it by boat to the US because that would be a less... Uh, less good path and that's also the role of the router examine the, the destination IP address and know where to best send a forward a package so what is a router well in essence it's a computer it's a special purpose computer but it does have an operating system a central processing unit uh, it does have storage and the storage is what's going to be uh, of a little bit importance to you throughout this course so there are different types of of storage within a router. First we have the RAM, the random access memory, which is a volatile memory. And volatile means that it only contains and maintains the data as long as it has power. So when the device is powered on, whatever is in the RAM is lost. And the RAM for a router will contain the running configuration. So it will con con uh, contain the configuration as it currently looks. Uh, then we have the ROM which is a non which is non volatile and contains boot up instructions and a limited version of iOS so the rom con uh, contains instructions for how the router should start where how to load load I iOS and so on and so forth and the limited version of iOS that's sort of used for recovery mode so if for some reason the full iOS cannot load then there is a limited backup version of the iOS so that you can do some maintenance and troubleshooting tasks and get the router up again. So then we have the non-volatile RAM and it's of course non-volatile meaning it, stay, it survives the power cycle and that contains the startup config and how it works is that you have the startup configuration that contains all the configuration that you did and saved to the startup config and during boot what's going to happen is that the router is going to take the startup config and make it the running config. And this is a good time to tell you that whatever configuration you do to a router is stored in the running config and you actually have to save it to startup config to, to keep it there. And you do that by the command copy running config to uh, copy running config startup config in privileged executive mode, which I'm going to show you in a little while. Finally, we have a flash memory, which is non-volatile and contains the iOS. And iOS is the, the operating system. You might may have heard iOS before from the Apple world, and you should know that Cisco was actually first with calling it iOS. Uh, and that's important. 
So looking at the backside of a Coma router, I'm not going to talk to you too much about this, but you should know that a router uh, contains a lot of ports. So for in instance, in this case, we have some local area network interfaces right here. We have some USB port and that can be used to uh, to copy out the running running and startup config we have a console port and the console port is used to connect to the router for initial configuration we have an auxiliary port that is used for dialing into the router through a remote them that's very deprecated um, and we do have some some other non uh, some other ports here or slots e h w i c slots that are currently uh, empty and what you can do here is buy modules and add ports to the router so you could buy network cards and input here if you want so not going to talk too much about that but what you should know is that there are a lot of ports on the router and uh, that you can use to enter to connect to the router or to connect the router to to other devices uh, so we're going to move on and discuss the term default gateway a little bit. And default gateway is, uh, is well, a term that I find the students have issues knowing what it is. And what is in networking, as you should know from CCNA1, is that for a device and then computer to access a network, that device needs to be configured with IP addressing, subnet mask, and a default gateway. So what is the default gateway? Well, the default gateway is the address of the router that is used to reach the internet. So if we look at this scenario, you can see that all of those devices here on the left-hand side are connected to a switch that is in turn connected to a router. And all of their default gateway is the IP address of this closest router. So in this case, it's 192.168.11, but it could just as well be 192.168.59 and 254. And that, but this address would still be what uh, to be configured as the default gateway. And as you see here, the default gateway for every device for every device is one of this router. And looking at the other side for the web server here then the, the default gateway of the web server should be the IP address of router 2 here, which is 172.16.1.1. So that's the default gateway. And the default gateway is the address of the closest router. So to continue the analogy with the post office, for any person that wants to send a letter, the default gateway would be the closest post box. So wh wh what do we do if you want to send a letter to... Uh, to someone ac across the globe or somewhere someone wherever well what you do is that you go to your closest post office or, or your cl closest mailbox and you put your letter there and then you just trust the post office to take care of it unless uh, unless you're a swede then you you'd rather go take a plane and go deliver the letter yourself because post the, the swedish mail service cannot be trusted and um, trying to yoke not funny um so that's it for the default gateway um Next, we're going to may have a short discussion on how we connect to the router. Uh, so, as I'm sure you understand, that to configure the router, you need to connect to it. Unfortunately, there is no automatic way of just hand putting your cell phone in front of it and having it connect through Bluetooth or some other nice protocol. Uh, you actually have to uh, to connect to it in a little bit more manual manner. So in a production environment, a router is usually accessed using a secure shell or SSH for remote management. So that could be the case here. The router has an IP address, it's fully functional. You can actually connect through it using SSH. Uh, however, when for the initial configuration, when you buy the router and take it out of the box, there's not going to be any configuration on it. In fact, all the interfaces, the network cards are going to be disabled. So there is no way of accessing it through SSH. So for that reason, what you have to do is use a console cable to access it using the console port and some terminal em uh, emulation software such as TerraTerm. Uh, and what you want to do then is start doing the default configuration and before I show you how to do it we're just going to have a little look. So what you want to do for basic configuration is to set a host name and that's very important to remember where the router is. They then you want to set a console password and the reason why you want to do that is because well if you don't have a password for connecting to the router through the console port then anyone can do it and if anyone gets physical access to your router they can do whatever configuration they want to it then we want to set a banner because well that's the cisco way of doing stuff 
and then we're going to set a password for privileged executive mode uh, remember that uh, when you uh, when, you, when you connect to a router, you get to user executive mode, then you type enable to get to privileged executive mode and to enhance the security, we want a password for that. Then we're going to configure the router for remote access over SSH. Uh, you can use Telnet as well, which is a very, totally insecure protocol because it sends traffic in plain text, including usernames and passwords. And, and it's also quite hackable. Then we're going to configure uh, IP addressing on interfaces and start in interfaces so that the router can communicate. And then we're going to configure the router to encrypt uh, any password that is stored in the running configuration. So this was quite a lot to grasp, I guess. But uh, if there aren't any questions, we're going to move on to uh, configuration. And when I ask for questions, I am aware that this is a video lecture. So calling me up and asking me questions in real time is going to be troublesome for you. But if you're doing this in class, questions mean that you should, should talk to your teacher if there are any questions. And if you're doing this on YouTube as uh, something that you do from home, you're free to leave questions in the common field and I will try to answer them or maybe some other nice person will answer them for you. So let's move into Packet Tracer and do a basic router configuration. So if you haven't been in Packet Tracer before or and if you don't feel used to it, uh, what you should do is go to the YouTube channel and uh, look at the Packet Tracer overview because I've done one and I'm not going to do it again. Uh, so for this, uh, for this practical, what we're going to do is that we're going to do a default configuration and then we're going to configure uh, IPv6 and IPv4 addressing on uh, two routers. So as you see here, we do have a uh, rather large network, at least from your point of view, uh, larger than you've seen in the previous course. We have a router here that is responsible for uh, connecting to those two networks and to access to, uh, access to the internet. Then we have this router that does the same for those networks and connects to the internet. And as you see here in the topology, there are addresses all over the place. Now on this side, we have IPv6 addressing, and on this side, we have IPv4 addressing. So what we're going to do is that we're going to start doing a default configuration of Route 1. And when we're done with that, we're going to set IP addresses on the interfaces that are connecting through the end networks here. I would encourage you to pause and do this on your own, either while listening to me or afterwards. Uh, so. Uh, you should also know that when we do those practicals, I'm, I'm most of the time using the uh, the Cisco, uh, the CCNA material practicals, but I'm not really following the, uh, the instructions all the time. And that is by design because I sort of want you to, to not get the full solution and just follow on and do exactly the same thing that I do. I want you to think about what you're doing. So let's go into router one and let's get going. So uh, go, uh, pressing a router and hitting CLI in Packet Tracer, that's the equi equivalent of connecting to a router over the console port. And as you see by the prompt here, we are now in user executive mode. So what we want to do first is that we want to do enable to get into privileged executive mode, which is the mode where you can do like loads of show commands. So if I do show question mark, you see all the different show commands that I can do. So for instance, you can do show running config to see the configuration that is currently loaded into the router. And so, but what we have to do to actually configure something is to go into the configuration terminal. And we do that by typing configuration terminal or conf t. And this is where we can do stuff. So the first thing that we're going to do is do a host name and we do that with the command host name and the host name that we want in this case R1. Next, we're going to do a banner and a banner a message of the day banner is configured with a command banner MOTD and then some sign and the banner that we want and then that sign again. So this some sign can be any sign of the keyboard, but the same sign that we take here is also going to be the ending sign. So I might as well do dollars or I can do um, exclamation points or questions, question marks or whatever. So but banner, MOTD, and then we set the banner. Next, we want to do a console password. And what we do then is that we have to go into line console zero to go into the console configuration mode. And then basically password, the password that we want to have, which is in this case will be Cisco. 
and then log in to enforce the login. Uh, next, we're going to do the SSH configuration. And configuring SSH is a little bit more troublesome because there are a few prerequisites. So to do SSH, what we have to do is begin with configuring a user. Then we have to configure a domain name for the router. And then we have to uh, generate some crypto keys, generate keys and when we're done with that we have we can enable SSH on our lines. So we're going to do that. It's quite simple actually. What we have to do first is username, admin, secret and then our password which will be Cisco. Uh, in this case I really encourage you to use secret instead of password because when you do secret it's going to be the password is going to be saved in uh, an encrypted format within a running configuration. If you do password it's going to be saved in plain text which is much less secure. So next we have to configure the domain name which we do by IP and domain name and the domain name that we want it doesn't really matter for making SSH work. We just need one so we can do uh, Cisco.se. And finally, we're going to generate crypto keys that are going to be used for encryption with, with a And we'll, the command for that is crypto key generate RSA modulus or Okay, so it differs a little bit between versions of routers. So in this case, it's just crypto key generate RSA. In some cases, it's all, it can be crypto key generate RSA modulus. But in this case, we can select the modulus number um, uh, after we do crypto key generate RSA. And uh, the higher the modulus number, the secure the keys, but also for lab purposes, the, lo the lower the key, the uh, key size, the faster they're going to be to create. So we're going with 512. So uh, the next, next and final thing that we have to do is to enable SSH on our lines. And in this case, it's the uh, VTY uh, lines. So line VTY zero and a question mark to see how many we have in this case we have 15 and it's quite important to make sure that you do it for all of them so for summer hours it can actually be up to over a thousand different lines and uh, so then we're going to do uh, transport input sh that tells the device to only allow SSH for these lines as you see if i remove sh and do question mark there can also be all none uh, and telnet and we don't want telnet we just want explicitly uh, to allow ssh so ssh and then login local and login local means that we should log in using a user in the local user database that we created uh, just typing login that's going to make sure that we log in using a password that we configure on the lines using uh, the password command but for this case, we want to use the user that we created, which is also required by SSH. So we do log local and then exit. And that's actually all for the default configuration. Uh, I want to show you one more nice thing. Uh, and you know that if I just type something weird here, um, okay, didn't work. Uh, some of the times you're going to have a lookup process. And uh, let's do a running config and we'll see if it's actually already configured oh. no actually it isn't but sometimes when you type an incorrect command there's going to be a lookup process where the router is trying to resolve uh, whatever you type as a domain name and that can take quite a while so to disable that you can do no IP uh, doom main look up uh, and that's just a little tip that I want to show you also you saw that I managed to show running config from uh, configuration terminal here and I will tell just show you that if I do show run which will show the running config then I will get input uh, invalid input because show run uh, and all show commands are privileged executive mode commands but if you want to run uh, privileged executive commands from the configuration terminal or any other mode you can do uh, do before and if you if I do do show run then I'm going to see it running configuration
So that's it. Uh, next thing that we're going to do is configure uh, the uh, configure interfaces on the router. So for for that, I'm going to take forward the IP addressing table here, and we're going to go configure the interfaces here on router one. And more specifically, we're going to configure the interfaces pointing towards PC one and the interface pointing towards PC two. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, let me stop moving things around and we're going to have a look at a table and we can see that the interfaces that we're going to configure is gigabit ethernet 00 and gigabit ethernet 01. So what we want to do is go is just type interface gigabit 00, zero to get into the interface configuration mode. Then we want to do IP address to set the IP address and first we type the IP address 172.16.20.1 and then we also need to have the subnet mask, which is pointed out in this case to be 255.255.255.128. And then we hit enter. And then as you see here, the little balls on the cables are red, meaning the cable is, or the link is shut down. Uh, that is the standard behavior on Cisco routers. The interfaces are always shut down. So you have to manually, ena manually enable them doing the no shutdown command. And when I do that, you see that you get some output here saying that link changed to up and you also see that the balls here are getting green. So let's configure the second interface as well. We do exit and then we do interface gigabit 01 and then the IP address in this case is 172.16.20.129.128. And, this, and we have to do IP address in front, of course. Uh, and know that you don't have to type the full commands. You only have to type enough to make the command unambiguous. So IP add will be enough here. Uh, IP address, the IP address and the subnet mask, 255.255.255.128. Uh, and then again, no shutdown. You see to the left here that the balls are getting green. Uh, yes, to make sure that it worked, let's see the IP addresses of the clients and we're going to do a ping. Ping is a privileged executive mode command, so we have to put a do in front. So do ping 172.16.20.10. And the first ping is always failing and that is because there is a ARP process taking uh, and taking place and the R process is going to make the first ping timeout. So in this case, the ping isn't working anyway. So maybe we have to configure a default gateway or something for the, uh, for the devices. Um, yes, we do. So let's go configure the PCs. I'm just going to do real quick. What you do is you click the PC, you go to desktop, you go to IP configuration and then for PC one, the IP address should be 172.16.20.10 and it must have the same subnet mask as the router to be on the same network and the default gateway now. The default gateway is going to be the address on the closest router. So for PC1, it's going to be the address of this interface here on the router, which happens to be 172.168.20.1. That's all correct. Let's do PC2 real quick. PC2 will have 172.168. No, 172.16. Let's say 150. Again, same subnet mask. 255.128. And the default gateway for this one is going to be this link. So that's going to end on 129. So 172. 16.20. Uh, 129. Now that should be all done. And we go back to the router and we try the ping again. And now we should see that it should work. And you see that it does work. The first of the ping messages here does fail. That's because of the uh, because there is an R process taking time causing the, the first ping to time out. But if I do it again, all five should succeed. So next thing we're going to do before we end is to configure IP address, IPv6 addressing on router 2. But I'm actually going to leave you to it so that you can do that on your own. So we're, instead, we're going back to the theoretical material. Um, 
And what we're going to do is to look a little bit more on the routing process and how the router does lookups. So beginning with a picture on the router switching that looks really hard. But I just want to say a couple of words about what happens if we have communication going from PC1 to PC2 in a scenario like this over three routers. So I'm just going to take it real quick. So what happens when we want to send some package from PC1 to PC2 is that PC1 is going to take a package from an upper layer protocol like a web browser and it's going to uh, it's going to encapsulate it with data from all the different layers in the OSI model. So we have the upper layers here, 7, 6 and 5. Then we have layer 4 where we have TCP UDP and we're going to uh, encapsulated with the correct port number and so on and so forth. Then we have layer three where we're going to encapsulate it with the correct destination and source IP address. Then we have layer two where we're going to look what MAC address to forward it to, which is always going to be uh, the next hop MAC address. And then we have layer one where we talk about how to physically transmit the data. So when we encapsulated the entire package, then we're going to send it out. And PC1 is going to send it and have the source IP address being PC2 and the source MAC address being the one of router one. So the package is sent to router one. The router one examines the destination MAC address and sees that, hey, this package is for me. Uh, I'm going to take care of it. So what happens first it is that it de-encapsulate the package. It has to de-encapsulate layer one, layer two, and layer three so that it can read the IP address. And then it makes a forwarding decision. So the router sees that, hey, this is destined for a PC2 somewhere out the world. Where should I send it to get towards PC2? Well, I'm sending it on towards router two. So what it is going to do is that it will uh, encapsulate it again. So it's encapsulating layer three, maintaining that information. It's going to re-encapsulate layer two, adding the destination MAC address as the, as the MAC address of router two. And it's going to add the source MAC address of its own interface and then layer one and then it goes to router two. Router two does the same thing again, examines the MAC address, sees that it's, the package is actually for router two to manage. It de-encapsulated encapsulates it to see the layer three addressing, sees that, hey, this is going for router two, where should I, or for PC2, where should I send it to go to PC2? Well, I should send it towards router three. Okay, let's encapsulate it again. Uh, encapsulate layer three, adding the correct MAC addresses, encapsulate it going for layer one, sending it to router three, same thing again, and it's going to be sent out to PC2 that is going to fully de-encapsulate the package to see the data content. So that's it. Let's look a little bit more on the router forwarding process. So the router forwarding process, that's the process that happens when a, when a router receives a package. So same scenario, PC1 is going to send a package for PC2. And what it's going to do is that it's going to take its own, uh, if we look at uh, layer three data, the data here, it's going to type in its own IP address as the source IP and the IP address of PC2 as the destination IP. Then for MAC address, the destination is of course, or the source is of course the own MAC address and the destination MAC is going to be uh, the destination MAC address of the device on the own network that is going to receive the package. So the destination MAC address is going to be the next hop, namely the router. So when the router gets this package, what it's going to do is that it will examine the destination MAC address and it's going to determine that it is indeed the intended recipient. So router one is going to say, hey, this is a package for me uh, based on the layer two address. And then it's going to identify the package as an IPv4 package. And it's going to be do that because of the type field here. It will then de-encapsulate a package to look at layer three addressing and the router then decides how to forward the package based on the IPv4. The IPv4 is, of course, the, uh, the layer 3 addressing. And then it's going to realize that it's going to send it towards router 2. That's going to be the next hop. And when it's going to send it to that, it's going to know what IP address to send it to. So what it has to do then is that it has to look for the MAC address of router 2 and it will do that in its ARP cache. And if that uh, if the IP address of router 2 is not present in the ARP cache, remember that the ARP cache is a mapping between IP addresses and MAC addresses. Uh, if it doesn't know about that mapping, it's going to send a ARP request out the link to see 
uh, to get to know about the MAC address of router 2. And then when that's done, it's going to encapsulate the package again and send it out the correct interface. So that's the router forwarding uh, process. So how is the forwarding decision happening? Well, uh, as we know, the package will arrive on the router interface and what's going to happen then is that a router is going to search its routing table for a match. And a routing table is a table of routes and a route is, ex is uh, you can say, a pointer to a destination network. So the routing decision is going to happen as follows. So first the router is going to see if the destination IP address in the package matches a con directly connected interface. Uh, if it does, then that means that the, uh, the intended dis uh, destination of this IP package is on a directly connected link, one that this router is responsible for, and then it's going to uh, check the ARP cache and forward it to the correct device on the local subnet or do a ARP lookup if necessary. So if the package does not match the subnet of a directly connected interface, then it's going to continue looking at the routing table to see if there is a remote network entry, a network that is not connected to the local router. And if that is true, if that's the case, then it's going to encapsulate the frame and forward it out the interface towards the next hop. So it's going to forward it towards another router. Uh, and if there isn't a remote network entry in the routing table, then it's going to see if there's a gateway of last resort available. And the gateway of last resort is basically uh, a default gateway for the router. Uh, it's in a routing table entry saying, well, if there is no, uh, if there is a package coming that's for a network that I don't know about, just send it that way and be done with it. Uh, if there is such a, such a gateway of last resort, then it's going to use that to, to encapsulate the frame and send it out. And if there is no gateway of last resort, then it's just going to drop the package. So, uh, the router is also uh, responsible for finding the best path to a destination network, as I said. And how does it do that? Well. First of all, you have to know that in many cases, there are several paths from one router to the destination network of an IP address. And the router actually assigns a value uh, to each path, and that value is called a metric, and is then used to decide on the best path. Uh, and the rule is that the lower the metric, the better the path. So it's the same thing that as when you're going to take your car and you're going to drive from uh, from Gothenburg to Stockholm, you're going to realize that there are two ways. One way is going to take you three and a half hour, and the other way is going to take you five hours. So the number of hours in this case is the metric, and the metric of three and a half hours is of course better than the metric of five hours, so you're taking the lower metric path. Uh, and if the metric for two paths is equal, then the router is going to distribute the traffic equally among the paths. So this is hard to do with a car, but let's say that you're a team, a soccer team that's going in 10 cars, then you can, and then five cars can take one way and five cars can take the other way. Then you are not going to uh, put that much stress on any of the paths, and you're still going to be there at the same time. And remember that this works because there are, usual, there are usually some kind of sequence numbering on packages, so it doesn't really matter in what order they are arriving at the end destination. Uh, so you should also know that routers can get routes from different sources, and they use a value called an administrative distance, or an AD, to determine the trustworthiness of a route. We're going to look at this in much more detail throughout CCNA2 and CCNA3. What you should now know for now is that the lower the AD, the more trustworthy the path. And what happens is that if there are two or more paths available, the router is going to show the path with the lower administrative distance. So you can actually do an analogy to the real world, real world here as well. Consider you have the option of going by train or by go or going by car. So in this case, going by car means that you know that you're going to get there. So the uh, so the administrative distance is quite low. Uh, maybe it would be five. Uh, going by train. Uh, you're not that sure because you're in Sweden and trains doesn't really work all the time. So the administrative distance will be 100 and in this case you're going to go take the car because you want to be sure that you can reach your destination. 
Uh, so finally, a couple of words on the routing table. And as we said, routes are stored in the routing table and those can be directly connected or remote. So we have routes to the networks that are physically connected to the router and, uh, and routes that are learned in some way to networks that are out in the distance. Uh, and they can be added as local router interfaces or directly connected. Those are for the directly connected routes. Or and we can have static routes, not routers as it says in the slides. And uh, that these are routes that are statically configured. Or we can have dynamic routing protocols that dynamically allows the router to learn about routes. Again, this will be explored much in much more details in the upcoming lectures. But for now, let's have a very short look on the contents of the routing table. So looking from the uh, beginning with the down part, part, part of the routing table here, it begins with a letter denoting the source of the route. So every line here is a route or route entry. And the first letter here denotes where it came from. So a D is from the dynamic routing protocol called EIGRP, as we can see here. All of those up in the code section here are codes for different sources. So the source is a D, meaning EIGPR. It could also be C for a directly connected route, S for static, and so on and so forth. Then, moving on, we have the remote network address. And after the remote network address, we have this administrative distance denoting the trustworthiness of the route. Then we have the metric, and you should know that the metric will be different and look different uh, depending on the routing protocol or how the route was learned. Then we have the next top IP, the IP address of the router where we should sh send a package to reach this remote network. And finally, we have the exit interface, which is the local router interface where we're going to send out traffic. So just a word on static and dynamic routes because before we have a little practical look. Uh, so static routes, those are statically configured routes. No surprise there. Those are denoted with an S in the routing table. And a default static route is comparable to a default gateway. And this is sort of a special static route that is used as a catch-all. And it's configured using the command IP route 0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0 .0 space 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0, .0, and then either an exit interface or an exit IP. That's for IPv4. And if we want to do it for IPv6, then we do IPv6 route colon colon slash zero and then exit interface or an exit IP. Uh, and the default route will be denoted gateway of last resort in the routing table. Uh, so a dynamic route is a route that is dynamically learned using a routing protocol and that is denoted by a letter that is specific to the routing protocol and we will learn more about this in lecture 3 and CCNA 3. So before we end, we're just going to have a quick look on the routing table from our scenario. So if we go back into router 1 here, I just want to show you that, oh, should remember the passwords, Cisco uh, enable Cisco, I just want to show you the routing table. And so what I'm going to do is show IP route to display the routing table. And I just want to show you here that we do have these connected routes. So here I have a route that is connected. And what this actually tells me is that I have a connected route because it's denoted by C. It's to this network address. It's directly connected, so there is no next top IP address, and the exit interface is gigabit ethernet 00. Also, there is a static route here, and it's a static route to the 00000 network, denoting that it's a, a default route. The administrative distance in this case is zero, and that is uh, the administrative distance of static routes. And the metric is zero. The administrative distance is one, didn't I say zero? Okay, anyway. And then we have the next top IP address. Uh, so uh, that's actually it. And that's, that's just what I wanted to show you. And as you can see, we also have the gateway of last resort up here. The little star of the S means that this route is a candidate to be a default route. And then this means that there is a default route going to network 000, meaning any network, 
through this address. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about for this first lesson. I decided to take it a little bit slow and hope I didn't bore you out. And so let's see you next time where we're going to look about look into static routing uh, in a little bit more detail. But for now, have a good day.